Everyone's got opinions when it comes to leadership, and let's be honest, how many experts do we all know? But where can we find real leadership advice that's not BS? Well, look no further. Welcome to No BS Leadership, where on each episode, we attempt to expose the gap between what leaders think they should be doing and what actually works without the BS. Listen in as we irritate some, inform others, and challenge all leaders to discover a better path to the leadership excellence we all want. Hello, friend. Welcome back to this episode of No More Leadership BS. With your cast here, we got Myra Hall, Dr. Sam Jennings, Jeff Geyer, Jeff Conroy, and me, Jeff Geoff McLaughlin. And we are, as always, excited to be here with you and share some knowledge. Let's face it, leadership can be challenging. We're just going to jump right into this one. Leadership can be really challenging sometimes, actually a lot of the time, because we're dealing with people. And anytime we deal with people, there's going to be conflicts, there's going to be confusion. Our job as leaders is to help that clarity, right? To help gain clarity in the purpose, mission, passions, all the things that we need to be successful as human beings. And we got a bunch of different people that we work with. But what today I wanted to talk about was it's easy to get caught up in the grind. It's easy to get caught up in the minutia and to not see the forest through the trees. But I want to look at where are those moments that we find joy in leadership? Where do those moments happen? Because if something, if the job of being a leader is so stressful and it just wears you down, there's no moments of joy, then you start to get into this really dangerous zone of mental health and wellness issues and high burnout and all that other stuff that goes with it. So I wanted to find out from you as leaders in your different areas, what are some moments of joy that you've had in leadership? And I thought I'd start off with an example from my years in education, particularly the early educational years. We like to call it the lower education because I was a kindergarten teacher and we had a good mix of students at our school. It wasn't like a high socioeconomic area, but it wasn't really low either. We had a really good mix of students and it provided One, highly entertaining conversations because kindergartners say the darndest things. But we also had an amazing staff. And even when staff was stressed out, we still had moments of laughter and joy because students provide lots of fodder for that because of the things that they say and do. But we had a principal who was a little bit hard-nosed at times, but she meant what she said and she said what she meant. And she came up with this thing where we had, if we had a particularly challenging week, She would get on the intercom at the end of the day and announce to all the teachers, usually on a Friday, say, hey, teachers, if you are interested in the poets meeting, please stop by the office and find out where we're going to have it tonight and what we'll be discussing. And everybody started going, well, what's the poets meeting? Because it was like an inside joke. We're like, what what does this mean? Well, poets meant piss on everything tomorrow, Saturday. (laughs) So this principal would have a rough week and recognize that in the staff and say, we're going to go down to the bar and we're going to have a beer and we're going to talk about things and see what's going on. And it was an unofficial meeting. You came if you wanted to. But I think by the third or fourth one we had in the year, we probably had half the staff at a school coming to these meetings. And those were some of the more productive meetings that we had because we laughed. (laughs) We engaged with each other on a personal basis. And we got to get over those really challenging and difficult things because we were laughing and having fun and there was the support system. And so that moment of joy out of what could potentially be incredibly high stress was like, those are the things that kept a lot of educators going. They kept people going because they went, oh my gosh, I am supported. I am cared for. I do make a difference. And thank you for helping me see something a little bit differently because a bunch of teachers, if you have a little kindergartner, that's their first year. But by the time they reach third or fourth grade, the stories start to compound. And then we get to talk to each other about how do we help each other out. So that personal connection is just absolutely vital. And one of the things that actually as a staff brought us joy. So I know that you guys like to laugh quite a bit because our green room, sometimes called the blue room, is generally (laughs) filled with laughter and other things. But I'm just curious, what are some of those moments of joy that you've had in leadership? And that could be either personally, you hit a goal or that how do we get our teams going? We got these people to turn it around and that was joy. 
seeing the progress in things. There's a lot of different things that bring people joy. So I'm just curious what that means to you and what experiences you've had. I will open up the floor. I'm just going to look around here to somebody who doesn't look absolutely befuddled. Mr. Jeffrey Geyer, you made eye contact. You get to go first. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I've never been to a poets meeting, but some compadres and I used to go to, to choir practice every Wednesday evening because choir practice at six o'clock listed on the schedule looked way better than going to a bar to, to hash out the realities of the challenges of the day with your buddies looked a lot better. So the, but the poet meeting sound like it'd be pretty good too. What Conroy? The bar or the choir sounds more interesting than meeting friends at a bar after the after. We just called it choir practice. Oh, okay. My bad. I apologize. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I had to remember who I was talking to. I apologize. Right. Yeah. We just called it choir practice because you didn't want to put beers with the fella on your, gotcha. fellas on your schedule for everybody <laughs> to see. So, yeah, I was thinking about this, about the joys of leadership. And there certainly are lots and lots of joys. But because we're humans, we tend maybe to focus on the things that aren't quite so joyful. Maybe that's where choir practice and the Poets Society and all that come from. But one thing jumped to my mind right away, and it really didn't have anything to do with business, everything to do with leadership. A direct report of mine came to me one day and said, hey, I've got this employee, we'll call her Alice, and I think if you talk to her, you would be able to help her. And, and I said, well, sure. And so the two of them came to my office one day and we talked about life. We talked about kids. We talked about communicating with our spouses. We talked about work. We talked about church. We, every, we didn't talk about profit and loss statements and productivity and employee benefits and health and wellness and th that kind of stuff. We talked about life. And it, it comes to me as one of those joyful moments for a couple of reasons. One, I firmly believe that leadership is about relationships. It's about lots and lots of things. But if you don't have a relationship with the people you're entrusted with, the people that you're supposed to lead, it, it gets a lot harder to lead them. So the whole relationship thing, I thought was really good that they thought enough of me as a person and our relationship was healthy enough as a person, not as a boss and employee, just as a person that they could help. And long story short, and I'm really not intending to blow my own horn really loud, but a little bit, we got done with that meeting. And I don't remember, it was maybe an hour or so. And we laughed during the meeting and we cried during the meeting. And when we were done, Alice said, Jeff, th this is the best, you know, hour I've ever spent. She was crying through tears and said, you have changed my life for the better. Mm. And right then it could have flown to the moon. And it was just like, oh my goodness, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be part of this process to help another human being get through the challenges that she was having. It had nothing to do with business, everything to do with relationship and connection. And even when I start to tell a story and I want to leave out details so that we don't really know who we're talking about, but this is a true story. And even when I talk about it, I start to get goosebumps because it was impactful and full of joy and all the good feels that you want to have when you help another human being. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I love that you said connection because that's exactly what that, that conversation was. It was an hour of you as a human being sharing time and space with another human being and connecting. And we are all designed to connect. And right. if we don't, we have severe issues, and especially in the right. workplace. If you don't have anybody that you're connected with, if you don't feel connected to it, your productivity and everything goes down. Right. So I mean, that there's, hour. Yeah, absolutely. No absolutely. Geoff, the part of this, this might be another a podcast episode, but because things in her life started to get better and things at home started to get better for her, things at work got better for her too. And it, it, the cold reality of it is she became a better employee, was more productive and more influential in the workplace and all those things. As her life got better, everything in her life got better. And yeah, that if we could impact and when we impact people as leaders, in, in that meaningful, foundational, very connected human way, 
man, the sky's the limit because things get really good really fast. Yeah. And it's amazing that connection piece. How, and then after that, did you have conversations with her? Just little snippets of things that were like, Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I still occasionally, mostly via text message, but sometimes like on Facebook or something, in, interact with her. How's it going? How are you kids? That kind of thing. Happy birthday, whatever those kind of things. So yeah, the connection that was made much stronger, deeper on that day during that meeting is, ha, has resulted in us still being connected, right? Awesome. Yeah. And that's one of those things. And then it doesn't take an hour long conversation every week. It's that connection piece that sets the bar that yeah. when you do those little check-ins, say, I still care about you. I still, you still matter as a human being to me, right. which yeah. just all the brain chemicals that say I'm important and valued and they recognized it. Absolutely yeah, it, brilliant. It was years and years ago and I'm still smiling. So it's, it was a very joyful thing. Okay. I love that. I love that story because it's about the human connection piece, which is not necessarily business related, but affects the business when you have the connections with the people that you're doing business with and around. So somebody else give me another story. Put some joy in my heart and some happiness on my face. Well, I've got one. It's not about the joy of leadership, but joy in leadership. And in my old world, my title was Dean of Students. And what that meant was I never met a student on their best day. And in addition to that joy, I also got to be a compliance officer. So that was best. People love compliance <laughs> officer. And part of that responsibility was to write an annual security report. And I had help. I'm not suggesting it was all me all the time. But I also had to share that information with other people. So during the vision meeting, probably 60 to 80 people, I was to give an update on this particular act and the laws around it. And one of the things that had changed was wherever students went for an official trip and stayed more than one night, we had to get crime stats from that space about that time. So let's say students travel to LA and hang out down by the Staples Center for two nights. I'm supposed to call the LAPD and get their crime reports from that area. Now, we have police departments so that did that. So I have to give this presentation to people who don't care. And I had a slide deck. So I got the slide deck all prepared. Got myself to the stage when it was my turn. What I didn't tell anybody was I had prepared under the stage a plastic bin. And on top of that plastic bin, it was with a lid on it, was a clearance rack, play school, possibly branded bubble machine. So without saying a word, I got up, walked behind the stage, pulled the thing out, clicked the button. You could hear a faint whine of the fan going. I get up on stage about the same time the bubbles start erupting from behind the stage. So here I am, my fancy pants jacket, my flat half act presentation, and bubbles are going behind me. They're getting in the way of the camera. They're getting on the screen. They're all over the place. And everybody's giggling. I'm doing nothing. I'm giving them no feedback. So I'm talking about this change where we have to get crime stats from all these cities. And I was very apologetic. I said, I didn't prepare fully. I'm sorry. I should have put this in my slide deck, but I've got my phone out. So I'm going to give you a list of some of the cities we need to report from. Again, I'm so sorry. It'd be on the deck. You should be able to read it, but please bear with me. So acting like I'm getting a list of cities, I instead played oh, uh, I've Been Everywhere by Johnny So Cash. I'm assuming that they got to stay at the Staples Center for those two days because the presentation was spot on. Just that good. Sometimes they go traveling and they do different, not sightseeing, but like look at architecture or infrastructure, those kinds of things. So I got a list of cities. I meant to read it. But instead, I played the Johnny Cash's I've Been Everywhere and said, okay, I played like one verse and said, that's a partial list. So all this flat nonsense of stuff that people don't care about, I tried to add some joy and some excitement because the information that we have every day, the things we have to do isn't always fun. So let's pepper in that joy and that excitement wherever we can. So Bubble Machine, Johnny Cash, and me saying nothing about it, giggles all across the space. So they got what they needed. I got what I needed to do. And nobody was heard the making of that presentation. And scene. <laughs> I actually took notes for my next presentation. Awesome. <laughs> Purchase Bubble Machine. Yeah. Try not to laugh. Don't tell anybody about it. Got it. Right, right. 
That's awesome, oh, man. That's funny oh. stuff, man. I wish every meeting was like that because that would just bring joy to my heart because I'd be so happy right. just to see the bubbles. And then to have somebody be able to stand up there and flat affect it would be a freaking riot. Mr. Conroy, how about you? I know you've had a lot of entertaining moments and in your career, yeah. in your tenure as a leader. Yeah. What are some of those moments that have brought you joy? What do they look like? Two really come to mind. And these are just joy for me. I've been lucky enough to work for a youth organization, and that was really a lot of fun. Work for the Boy Scouts. And when I very first started, it was my first introduction into nonprofit work. I, I was sent to Boy Scout camp. And I was the business manager. So we were talking earlier and about how some people are more in the blue room, how some people are more financially minded than others. At that time, I was not. <laughs> I'm like, I got $2,200 to spend. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> But the camp director and the program director were both really good friends of mine. And I knew them for years before I even joined the Scouts. And one of the things that we did, we were close to Portland, Oregon. So one of the things we wanted to do was give inner city kids an opportunity to experience, to have a camp experience. Now, this is 1989, 1990. Buds and the Crips were in full bloom in Portland, Oregon. So we were really focusing on the inner city kids and we really wanted a certain age specific area. So we brought them in. They came in on a Friday afternoon and we ran them through the program and we had the late night campfire. And of course they were up all night. The first night of camp is always the worst. Even when you take your own kids camping, the first night's the worst because everyone's just amped. You're just excited to go. So Saturday morning, I made sure breakfast was ready. And if you've never done a Boy Scout breakfast, it, there's a lot of it. There's not only peanut butter and jelly on every table, but there's pancakes and bacon and syrup and cereal. And there's all sorts of stuff. And there was this one little boy. I'll never forget this one. One little boy who came up to me and he had his tray and he had a couple big old pancakes the size of his face. And he had his carton of milk and he had some bowl of cereal and I think he had a donut on there and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. More than I can't even eat that. And he comes up to me and he goes, how much can we have? And I said, man, I said, you can have as much as you want. He goes, my mom never lets me have this much. Mm -hmm. And I, at that point I was like, yeah, okay, I'm going to do nonprofits. This, uh, it, it, it touched me. That was a beautiful moment for me. And then the other one was when I was the director of St. Vinny's, winter was coming and I really wanted to make sure that kids who cannot afford winter shoes and winter coats had them. So we had what was called the warehouse. So all the donations go into one central location. And it's a freaking literally a warehouse. And it's three levels and it's separated by type and size and color. We used to take people on tours there and they were like, holy crap. It was just huge. <laughs> and so I worked with the school counselors and I said, can you identify those kids uh, that don't have winter shoes and winter coats. They were all about it. So we picked a day and we picked a time and these kids showed up and we got them decked out in winter shoes and in winter coats. But it became really apparent that siblings and parents don't have winter shoes and winter coats. So we actually stayed a few hours longer and everybody who came got shoes and coats. And some people even got some other stuff that they needed, like gloves and a hat and things like that. But after that, yeah, I'm going to say we were there for about six hours doing this. And my, my staff that was there helping them, it was just, they were talking about it to everyone else for weeks. And I, you felt, I don't know, you just felt like you did something good. You made a difference. And that was a great day. That was a great day. So if we're going to talk about joy, those are two of the bigger ones. I know we're going to do an episode here in a little bit on leadership and connections, and I got stuff for that as well. But I just think making connections with other people and watching them succeed, just sit back and watch it happen is joy. It's just great stuff. Isn't it interesting how the stories that we hear, those affect us by hearing somebody else's story? And that's that connection piece because we connect through story. Yeah. And we can feel empathy and we can feel emotion and we can feel inspired because we know the story behind what connected others and we can learn from that and that helps us to to that the whole pay it forward so 
Sure. I love it that they're all about connection some, through some way, shape or form, whether it's a deep conversation and tears or little kindergartners made you cry. So you had to go talk to your other teacher friends about it, or you have the bubble machine talking about bloods and crips straight up. Yeah. Answer, yo. Bloods and crips. Yeah. <laughs> We used to live on, we used to in Portland, we used to live on 37th street and I'd get people from, I'm from Eastern Oregon and I'd get people calling me, friends in Pendleton calling me saying, Hey, there was a shooting by your house. I go, really? Where? They said 165th. I'm like, that's Gresham. <laughs> that's a good 45 minute drive from my house. It was near your house. Lived in, I lived in Gresham. That stuff is real. Yeah. No, I gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> it was just you hilarious. Complex. Oh my oh, yeah. gosh. Every single day was an episode of Jerry Springer every day. And I'm yeah. like, I would literally just sit out and just watch the fecal fest that was the apartment complex mm-hmm. inner sanctum. It was like a gladiator stadium mm-hmm. and with a pool in the center. Ha, ha. And so, yeah, oh. true story. I was at a meeting one night in our apartment complex in Beaverton and I come home and my wife's on the couch with our daughter with a blanket pulled up to her eyes. I go, what happened? And she goes, the police raided the room upstairs with the battering ram. And she goes, I look out the back window and there's people with automatic rifles. And I was like, yeah, it's time to move. <laughs> we, should move. We, should probably, we should think about going someplace else. Yeah, we moved. And that's when we moved to Milwaukee, Oregon. So <laughs> Milwaukee. Oh, it's a great town. Great place. Great I love place. Milwaukee. I love, the I, love tools. I love Milwaukee. And Sam, it's Gemini's my favorite gladiator. Gotcha. <laughs> He's from Yakima. He's from Yakima. So you got to have that. Just learned something new today. Hey, folks, I learned something today. See, the more I can see the star. Yep. Sorry. Well, Myra, how about you? I know that sometimes it's challenging. You were in the world that was, I would say, incredibly difficult with managing people and apartment complexes and doors, all that kind of stuff. That's where do you find the joy in that? There, that's an easy one. There is none. Just not. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, there is none. It's all bad. <laughs> well, it's all right. That's been a great difficult. episode, everybody. <laughs> yeah, burn them with fire. Oh, I my God. Didn't, because you're manager, not necessarily, manager of doors is not a connection experience, I guess, is what. And your really customer, your client is not the people that you rent to. It is the owner of the building. So you don't ever have a connection there. Your worth is pretty much decided on if you need people to pay. That's and keep the apartments rented, that type of thing. I didn't get a lot of joy until I moved up to a regional and helping people become their potential. Sam asked a question on Facebook the other day, what's your superpower? And I think seeing people's potential is maybe mine because I've always been able to spot and develop it. So that takes me, yeah, I'm going to go fast forward into the real estate years and my team. And I can tell you what did not give me joy was when every year we'd get these awards and we'd have to confront everybody. And then you bring them home, you put them on the shelf and they start gathering dust. Does not bring joy to me. But I had one specific instance that I was sitting here thinking about it while you guys were talking is I had a record buyer's agent. She was awesome. Once she made the connection with people, uh, there, there was no shaking her loose. But she, she didn't know how to set boundaries around the connection. And one of the things that makes you a successful buyer's agent, if you will insist, if you will, lead people into assigning an exclusive buyer's agency so that they promise to work with you to buy a house. Now, some people agree with it, some people don't, but if you're making money by by helping people and ends up in nothing, then you're not spending your time wisely. So nothing wrong. Let them go on to somebody else. That's okay. But at least you're buying. But anyway, she was scared to death to do that because she was afraid she'd lose a connection. So as a leader, I had got the privilege and don't know if you guys will relate to this or not, but I got the privilege of pushing her that first. 
because she wasn't going to take it on her own. And I took a risk. It was somebody had dumped her again, bought a house with another agent, and she was devastated. Not that they bought a house, but that they rejected her. And uh, so from point on, it says, you will not work with any more. I just laid down the law. You're not going to work with any more buyers unless they sign a buyer's agreement. That's, I don't want this to happen to you again. And so from then forward, she practiced. And the first one, she was nervous. And I'm telling you, that changed her life. That changed her life. And watching her bloom like that, and she's one of the number one agents in the area right now. Because she learned how to do that, gives me joy that I was part of the process that brought out her potential and basically set her free to live a life that, that she wanted but didn't know how to get. And it's interesting. Again, it's that connection piece of you got to be a part of somebody's story to help them get better. Right. To help them move up the chain to seeing that potential in another human being and Having being willing to have a hard conversation is, I, it, and I think that's one of our episodes we're going to talk about here coming up is having those hard conversations, but the ability to do it in a way that affects a person that changes their life for the better, because that's what they need to hear. And then to see well, the joy, it, the result. And she knew I had her back. The relationship was established. It mm-hmm. was speak the truth and love type of a situation. It wasn't me laying down the hammer because my bottom line was being affected. It was me laying down the hammer because I knew it was good for her. Just like we do with kids. We have to make decisions for our kids so that they go down the right. Sometimes you have to do that with your team members. Oh, yeah. Yeah, true. Well, that is awesome. I love hearing the stories. This is just, it's just for me, I connect through the stories. I love it. I think it's awesome. For those of you out there who are listening right now, whether you're on a run, you're in your car on your commute, we would love to hear your stories of joy and leadership. What are the things that you've had happen or that you've been privy to or part of that have brought you joy in your daily life or in your business life? We want to hear those things. You can hit us up on Facebook. You can send us a message at, at ask us at leadershipbs.co. You can find us on some of the other socials, but we would love to hear your story because that's how we connect. And we want to share the joy. We want to share the good things in leadership as well as how do we get through the hard stuff? Because we can do a lot more things together than we can on our own. We are better together. So from all of us here at the No More Leadership BS podcast crew, we thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your week wherever you are. And we'll chat with you again real soon. See you later. Bye. 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 Bye